Hey, what's up, guys? It's Michael from the Honest Youth Pastor back with another sermon review. Today, we are going to be looking at uh, Grant Castleberry. Um, somebody has sent this in a while back, actually, making it down through the list. Grant is the pastor of Capital Community Church. Not sure where that's at, to be honest with you. Um, but I wanted to do uh, a sermon for more of a uh, traditional background. I know we did uh, one last week with Owen Strand. And, um, but that one kind of got eclipsed <laughs> by, uh, by eclipsed, I mean, completely covered up by the other bonus sermon review we did on that, um, that kind of that pastor that went viral, uh, for talking about his free marriage counseling. So, uh, I released two last week and, um, yeah, so we're going to try to balance that out with another one here from Grant Casberry, uh, Cast Castleberry. I hope I'm saying that right. So. To be clear, I always want to let you guys know how many times I've watched these sermons before I do these reviews, so you kind of get an idea of um, how I'm assessing them, right? So as we do with all sermon reviews, this is not to say, hey, this is a better sermon, this guy's a better preacher than so-and-so or whatever, uh, because everybody we review honestly has different sizes of churches, different sizes of audiences. Uh, some of them you've heard about before, some of you have some of them you haven't heard about before. The point is to say, if you were to walk into any church in America right now and sit down, are we going to be able to, as believers, are we going to be able to listen and say, was this a good sermon? Uh, was the text exegetically handled correctly? Uh, was, is that what the Bible says? Like, and just discern, you know, the, the red flags, uh, the good things. And that's the purpose of these sermon videos. So in case this is your first time here, the reason we do these is to assess the sermons. Is this good? Is this bad? What should we look for? What should we listen for? How, you know, what are the words that are saying? That sort of thing. So we'll get into that. But to be totally transparent, uh, again, this I'm getting really bad at this. My weeks have been so busy, I haven't been able to uh, to review any of these beforehand. So this is my first watch through of this sermon. Um if you want to watch this sermon without my commentary, which again, as I always say, I would totally understand, the link will be in the description below. Uh, if the, the, we're, we're, we're starting at, as you can probably see on your screen, 19, about 19 minutes in, a little 19 and a half minutes in, uh, because the worship's done, the announcements are done, so this is when the sermon starts. Uh, we will be... Yep, listening to this at 1.5 speed, just like we have with every sermon review. And um, that just helps us get through the sermon a little bit quicker. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'm not sure how long this is. Uh, we'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. But with the un unedited sermon reviews, the whole point is to watch the whole thing through and comment on it. So I've not seen this before. I have no clue what we're getting into. Uh, today, the title of his sermon is Apostasy in God's Church. Uh, this was preached on February 14th, 2021. Um, also, in case you're new here, I try to get the most recent sermon that they preached or that I can at least access through YouTube. And uh, his text will be 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Um, so, without further ado, uh, without me talking a ton, let's get into it. Well, good morning. God is good all the time. Thank you, worship team. Wasn't that marvelous this morning? Listen, that was fantastic. Thank you. Grace unmeasured, love untold. That's Christianity. No perfect people, but broken sinners who come to a perfect Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. God is love. That's the meaning of Christianity. God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So don't think of God as a stern master that's over in the corner that doesn't want to hear from you. God has his arms open, and he loves you. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning. I think we all need to hear that. But he loves you. He loves you as much as he loves his own son. This morning, uh, for our scripture reading, I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We are going to be talking about apostasy in God's church today. Happy Valentine's. <laughs> and welcome to Capital Community Church. Um, no, this is a serious issue that, that Paul addresses in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We've been systematically working our way through this remarkable book. And, and Paul has to deal with it issue. Okay, so real quick, before we, uh, before we get too far into it, in depending on what church you've grown up in, and we've talked about this before, there's different methodologies as far as how to approach Scripture, right? Uh, from what I can gather here, uh, Grant, he said we're systematically working through 
first timothy my guess is if we were to go back again i haven't looked bad research on my part but uh my guess is they've probably worked through different chunks expositionally through the word so what i mean by expositionally in case you're new to that word is they've just that's they've they've worked through that that letter uh that paul writes timothy uh verse by verse in different chunks as they've worked all the way up to this point so i'm sure there's probably if you were to go to capital community churches um apparently this is in raleigh so maybe north uh, carolina uh if you were to go to their their youtube page here and go to their playlist they probably have one uh that has all of timothy but the idea here is that and i and just to full disclosure again uh just to kind of show my cards i prefer this method because uh as you walk through uh whatever book of the bible it is expositionally you see how each part builds on the other so it's not it's incredibly hard to take things out of context because you've already seen the context like you under you know what was said in the last chapter that probably is feeding into what you're reading now as well as it gives you such a full picture of everything that was said and not just like you know the the coffee cup scripture verses right it gives you the this the, the fuller picture of what was actually being talked about and why it was being sent and why why the topics were being addressed, all of these things. Um, but this appears to be how, how Grant's working through First Timothy. In Ephesus, and he directs Timothy to it. This is what he says. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from, abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Let's go now to the throne of grace in prayer. Heavenly Father, may this morning we see Christ. Let us see Christ. Let us be enthralled by the Lord Jesus Christ, who showed such marvelous and wonderful love for us. And Lord, we pray that we would be a church that, where we would treat one another as if they were the Lord Jesus themselves because that's how you look at each one of us to those of us who are united to Christ in faith. You look at us and treat us like you do our older brother. You treat us like the Lord Jesus Christ. You bestow on us every spiritual blessing as you bestow on Christ. What marvelous grace is this that you treat us like this, Lord, as sinners and as rebels and as, as fallen people, as those who fall so far short, yet you treat us as you do the Lord Jesus Christ. May we have that same compassion in mercy, in love for one another. We pray, Lord, that we would see what a wonderful reality it is to be united to the Lord Jesus Christ. What confidence that gives us that we don't have to crawl into your presence or sit in your presence, Lord, but that we can come before the throne of grace and stand in your presence boldly. And Lord, it is in that spirit that we do confess our sins, knowing that your mercies are so great your mercies are new every morning, you say. And so, Lord, we come this morning and we do confess our sin and we do receive your mercy. Our sins are many, but your mercies are more. We pray, Lord, for the missionaries this morning that are laboring on the continent of Africa, those laboring in, in so many different contexts and cultures across that incredible continent. We pray, Lord, specifically this morning for our brother, Vodi Bakum, who is suffering heart failure and trying to make his way back to the United States and now is in South Africa trying to get a flight. We pray, Lord, that you would spare his life and that you would continue to use him for the advance of the kingdom. We pray, Lord, for this nation, this country. We pray, Lord, for those that have power in government, our leaders. We pray, Lord, for President Biden and, and those in the Senate and the judiciary branch and, and those in Congress. We pray, Lord, that they would legislate laws and, and rule in such a way that we can live peaceful and quiet lives, as Paul exhorted Timothy earlier. Lord, we want to live peaceful and quiet lives so that the gospel may continue to advance. We pray, Lord, for a singular purpose regarding your kingdom mission. You have called us, Lord, to advance the gospel in this world, and you have told us that that is the only way that your kingdom will advance. And so, Lord, may we be about 
our master's service. May we have hearts of evangelist, a desire to see men and women and boys and girls come to know the risen Christ and experience the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that you have shown us. Lord, may we see Christ and may Christ bubble up from our hearts and spill over into every relationship that we have. We pray, Lord, this morning for faithful preachers across the globe who are standing up with a Bible and reading God's word and trying to teach it to their people. We pray, Lord, that you would equip them, that you would use them, and that your people, your sheep, would be fed. We pray, Lord, now for us as we come to your word, you promise that your word never returns void. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do a work in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit by the word of God. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, a mere man, as I seek to preach Christ and him crucified in these words from the great apostle Paul that you inspired. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. <laughs> so, again, I mean, you're getting my first impressions here because I haven't seen this before or ever heard of Grant before, but I can tell you right there that tells me a lot about him as a pastor. Like, look, I listen to a lot of sermons, okay? I mean, you, you've, the reason I started doing these sermon reviews is because I was already doing this. I just wasn't recording it. Like, I, I've, I've listened, I listen to a lot of sermons um, just because I, I like to hear different methods of preaching and things. But I'll tell you what's missing. What's missing from almost all of them it, are, are, are long prayers like that. And that's not even a super long prayer, but that's a long, that is the longest prayer in a Sunday service that I've ever watched in any sermon review, uh, or probably heard, in, I mean, I, I don't, I think, I don't think I've heard a longer one. But this is what it tells us about Grant and his church that they believe in prayer. Like they don't have to tell me that. They don't have to say that. They don't have to have a series on that. Like that tells me that. I mean, did you hear? I mean. There was so much in that for the nation, for other pastors, for uh, situations that are well known within the church, like praying for those things, knowing that like God, God is the one that handles these situations. I mean, that tells you, that tells me pretty much all I need to know about this church. They are, I would imagine, a praying church. Now, I don't want to assume too much. I don't want to, you know, go, go over, overstating anything, but that says a lot. Um, tells me he, he's not in a hurry to, to speak out whatever he's going to speak. Like he, he has contemplated that he's prayed about, like, again, I don't want to overstate this and really dwell on this point, but it's been a long time since I've watched a sermon review online that there's been a prayer like that. That's good stuff. Let's, let's keep going. I would invite you to open your Bible back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. We're going to be studying apostasy in God's church. I think I know this church pretty well at this point. I think I know that we are all ready to fight the battles that need to be fought. This church knows that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We know that. I think we all are ready to take up the armor of God and stand for truth. As Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, we are ready to make a defense of the faith. We know that the whole world, as Paul says, is under the domain of darkness, under the domain of Satan. We're not naive. We know what we are up against. And we are prepared to go to battle for the truth of the gospel. To use a naval metaphor, if we were having to do battle on an old ship of the line, we are poised for action. Our cannons are loaded, our powder's dry. The Marines are on deck with their rifles, ready for battle. We're ready to face the enemy ship. But what happens? What happens when a mutiny begins to take place? When you're expecting to face the enemy on the outside, and then all of a sudden, you're facing the enemy on the inside. When those that you thought were your friends turn out to be your foe. When those that you thought were going into battle with you start battling against you. How do you respond when the person you thought was your friend is now against you? Or worse, when the officer on deck, the, the very officers who are supposed to lead you, begin to commandeer 
the ship. To put it in terms of the church, what do you do when people in the church you love and begin, that you have loved, begin to expound doctrine and ethical viewpoints that are contra the Bible and against historic Christianity? What do you do when your pastor or elders are in the midst of doctrinal drift? So this is, I want to stop here real quick. I mean, I, uh, the, I don't know if the sermon series was planned, like I'm sure the sermon series was planned, but I think this, this particular sermon is very helpful to all of us right now because there, I mean, no matter what church you're in, it is always possible to have that doctrinal, <clears throat> that doctrinal drift. I, I know that I can count on two hands how many people that I went to uh, ministry school with and graduated with that don't hold or espouse any what would be considered orthodox doctrine anymore. Um, and I've only been out of, I've been out of school for, out of college for um, about 15 years. So, I mean, that's, that's a really good amount of time to be passed uh, in order to kind of, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's a long amount of time for people to shift. Um, and I think that's one of those things that, that I think, I think this is going to be helpful. I don't want to speak too soon here, but I think, um, this sermon specifically will be helpful to any of us that, um, that, that recognize that the doctrine right now is this really fragile thing. There are people that are, um, I don't know if it, yeah, attacking, let's just say attacking, attacking it and, and really chipping away at it. So this is, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm very helpful for what he's going to say here because I think this is going to be helpful because what he is saying is that you're, I think we're always prepared as the church to, to, you know, quote, fight culture, go against, because we know that people outside of the church don't know Jesus. So of course we're going to have to defend the faith to them. But, um, I think his analogy here, I mean, we've talked about analogies before, right? Stories. Um, is very helpful. He's talking about if you're on a ship, uh, what happens if there's a mutiny and you're leading it? What do you do? So what about if the people in your pews start espousing false doctrine and you're the pastor, what do you do? Or what if you're in the church and your pastors start espousing false doctrine? Um, I know of situations in where both of those things have happened um, in separate churches, but I know of situations in both of those regards. So I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that all of us at some point will have to deal with this in, in some form or fashion. So, and this again, ha, <laughs> is why that I think it's helpful to preach through books of the Bible like this, because then you'll come across this and you have to deal with it, right? So anyway, uh, not really anything critique of the sermon here as much as just saying, I think this, this is going to be helpful uh, for us because um, it's needed. Let's keep going. You see, now you're facing the battle on the inside. And that is exactly what Paul is addressing Timothy with here in 1 Timothy 4. If you remember, this whole book was written after Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Paul was imprisoned twice. Uh, the first time he was released, probably 62, 63 AD. Then he went on a fourth missionary journey. He sends Timothy to Ephesus to put the church into order. And if you turn over to chapter 1, uh, Paul is very explicit why he sent Timothy to Ephesus, and it was to deal with false teachers in the church. He says in verse 3, he says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations. In other words, he sent Timothy to Ephesus to tackle false teachers head on, to tackle them. This is the... So you can see here real quick that just, uh, just a little um, pointing out of what we should be listening for. He very briefly, I mean, so if you're just walking into this church today, you've obviously not been here for the full study of Timothy. Um, but for the help of just a reminder for those that are there, as well as for maybe that somebody's just walking in, um, he's tying that together, which again is why working through books expositionally is very good. Because now he's saying, hey, remember when we read back in chapter one, what Paul left him with, he left him there specifically for this reason. And then what we see is the, the this is what Paul's telling him how to deal with this reason that he sent him there. Um, as well as giving us just enough historical background so we can understand kind of what's going on. Um, I don't know if you're a history nerd or if you even care about that part of it, but it's helpful timeline wise for us to understand, you know, what was going on at the time, uh, where this is in Paul's missionary journeys. Um, what, you know, 
who, who the leaders are at that. I mean, it's, it's, it's all very helpful information to kind of give us a pinpointed location about what probably is happening uh, at this church at the moment. Apostolic method. It's not just to let false teaching fester in the church. It's not to be indolent or worse, accuse those that are tackling false teaching of being divisive. It is to tackle the false teaching head on. You remember what Edmund Burke said? He said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. If there's a mutiny on the ship, you can't just do nothing. You have to respond. And that is exactly what Paul is telling Timothy to do. So how are we to respond? Turn back to chapter four. How are we to respond? I want you to write in the the margin of your Bible next to verse one. Expect apostasy. Expect apostasy. Look at the first verse. He says, now the Spirit expressly says... Paul says that the Holy Spirit, in no uncertain terms, is saying something. And what the Holy Spirit is testifying is that there will be apostasy in the church. There will be false teachers trying to take over the church. This prediction, Paul says, is clear, it's unmistakable, it's certain, it's inevitable. Then he says that this will happen in latter times. Now, that phrase, latter times, we tend to think about the period right before the Lord Jesus comes back, that Christ will come back in the end. The latter times is that period of time right before the Lord Jesus comes back. But that's not how the apostles understood it. The apostles understood the latter times to be the whole period beginning with Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was breathed into the church until the Lord Jesus returns. All of that is the latter days or the latter seasons. For example, John says in 1 John 2.18, he says, children, it is the last hour. Right now, it is the last hour. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.20 that Christ was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. By the way, that word time, it's not chronos. That's, that would be our word for uh, like the time of day. It's kairos, which means season. It is the last season. It's the last epic. It's the last period of redemptive history that we're in, this period between Pentecost and the Lord's return. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, to sum it up, that the Holy Spirit is testifying that in these last times, between Pentecost and when the Lord returns, that many will depart from the faith and will become false teachers. They will... So helpful word there. So I, I, um, what we're looking for, right? So you it is the ability for a pastor to be able to point out those small details like we just saw there, right? So for most people, if you attend a church such as this that Grant is preaching at, uh, it's sort of expected that there's going to be some explanation there. However, there are churches that don't do this, and this is why I want this to kind of put this in your head as far as this is a good thing, right? So he points out uh, something that could be misinterpreted, has been misinterpreted, uh, which is la- latter, ta- latter days, right? And says, hey, this is the common explanation for what we think of this, but actually within their vernacular, within their thinking, this is what they're they're actually thinking about this time frame between Pentecost and Jesus' return. And then he gives through, as we've talked about before, a few examples elsewhere in Scripture to demonstrate that, you know, this isn't just found in First Timothy. This is actually founded in a couple other verses as well. Here's a, is a couple of examples of those verses. And then Grant even does something further, which is very nice, which is say, hey, you know, time, which is, you know, our perception of what the word time means is actually there was a couple different words in Greek. It was this or that. And then the way he's using it is actually uh, for season and not like, you know, time on a clock. And this is helpful for his congregation, right? Now, there's a lot of people that out are in the con- that are out in the congregation that um, may not look into that, may not have any interest in Greek, may not have any interest in delving into those words outside of you know their their Bible study time. Uh, but the idea here is that as a pastor, his his one of his purposes is to preach the word, which is to explain it and teach it. And these little um, things that are being stuck in here are helpful, right? We should look for these things. We should want these things because there are going to be times when a pastor is preaching through a sermon that a word comes up, such as latter days or time. And within Greek, right, there were, just because it's it's translated as time, it could have been a different Greek word. There's a lot of Greek words that have very similar meanings and the, the, the nuance of how that is used actually can make it mean one thing or another thing. And that's why it's so important um, to uh, have, you know, viable, good, literal translations, word for word translations, at least to study off of as well that you read along with, because um, translated incorrectly, uh, it could give a a whole nother sense to what is being said. Um, So I'm not saying, you know, I'm not a translationalist in the sense that you have to have this or this translation. I'm just saying, be aware of that. 
And what's helpful is when a pastor preaches in this manner and actually is teaching in this manner, it helps the congregation um, uh, to, to understand what's, what's going on and what's happening, right? So these are things we should be looking for. When we're going to a church, sitting down, hearing a sermon, we should, we should almost expect, again, not some big dissertation on a Greek word every single time or even multiple Greek words, but we should have... Um, an expectation of a certain explanation of some things like was done here. I think Grant did it well because he states his point, goes through it very quickly, puts a bow on it, and then uh, is now moving on. But the idea here is that we understand his what he was trying to teach us, which was that this is what latter days mean, so that we have an idea and a lens to view that through for the rest of this the, the text that he'll be reading today. So let's get to it. It will jettison the, the true doctrines of Christianity and we'll expound, Paul says, momentarily, doctrines of demons in the church. Fascinatingly, Paul made a prophecy by the Holy Spirit that this very thing would happen. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 20. Turn to Acts chapter 20. This is at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, and he desires to speak to the Ephesian elders, but he doesn't want to stop in Ephesus, so he asks them to come to the port town of Miletus, and he gives a very passionate and emotional charge to these elders, but what's striking is a prophecy he makes regarding them. And I want you to look at verse 28. This is what he says. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now listen, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in Notice this next phrase, among you, among the guys he's talking to, among these Ephesian elders, fierce wolves will come in among, amongst you, not sparing the flock. Can wolves do serious damage to a flock? Oh man, one wolf could do serious damage to a flock. One wolf can decimate an entire flock. He says, from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And look what he says, 31. Therefore, be alert. Be alert. It comes from within. We shouldn't be surprised by this tactic from Satan. Satan's too smart and too cunning to merely fight the battle against us on the outside. He wants to plant wolves who are in sheep's clothing on the inside. He wants to stage a mutiny in God's church. This has always been Satan's tactic. Martin Luther said this, he said, as soon as Christ builds his church, Satan begins building his inside of it. In the Old Testament, you read about the lying prophets who lied to the children of Israel. You look at the ministry of Jesus, Satan opposed him at every step, didn't he? The temptation, demonic warfare, but who did he plant on the inside? Judas Iscariot. Early on, Satan infiltrated the churches in Galatia with false teachers who taught a gospel of faith plus works. Paul had to confront that. That's probably the earliest New Testament letter. Satan launched an attack at the church at Coloss with false teachers who taught a gospel of Christ plus asceticism. And John tells us in Revelation that a group called the Nicolaitans had come into the church at Pergamum and taught a licentious form of Christianity. In other words, that you could be a Christian and live in sexual immorality. That's what they taught in Pergamum. What's amazing, I think, when you study the New Testament is how often the apostles are having to deal with this issue. You get the sense that they are spending just as much time dealing with false teachers and apostasy as they are spreading the gospel. They start their work, and as soon as they do it, Satan comes behind and begins to build his church within the true church of God. Peter says this. You don't need to turn there. Just jot these verses down. Peter says this in 2 Peter 2.1, referring to the Old Testament first. He says, but false prophets, this is in the Old Covenant, also arose among the people. Now listen, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, says this in Jude 3. He says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. That's an interesting phrase. Who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, so what I wanted you to notice real quick, um, that it's just standing out to me as a distinction here. And again, I'm sorry if I'm not giving a ton of feedback here, because again, I'm trying to listen to it while also process what I can, what, you know, what's good and what's bad here. Um, 
um, which is one of the negative things of just watching this for the first time. But I, I want you to notice something that's happening, right? That is distinctively different than um, a good number of the sermons that I review or listen to, um, which is that Grant here, I mean, you want to talk about anchored in scripture. Um, all this, all this guy has done is, is drop that anchor in scripture and then just, you know, chug along. Uh, I mean, we're hitting scripture everywhere. Uh, and th this is a good thing. Like, this is a great thing. This is what we should listen for. Like, there's not been any point in this sermon where it's like, well, Grant said this, and that's why it was really good. It's been, hey, uh, Grant pointed to this scripture, Grant pointed to this scripture, Grant pointed to this scripture, Grant pointed. To this. I mean, all he's done is bring up scripture and scripture and scripture, which is, which is great. And showing where off the main topic of what we're talking about in first Timothy chapter four, that this isn't like all he's doing is drawing a consistent line, showing that within the early church, there were, there was all of this apostasy. There was all of this false teaching. And I think his point is good. And I've never really heard that stated that way before, but uh, the apostles and the early, the early disciples were, I mean, they were fighting apostasy as much as they were trying to preach the gospel, um, which is true. I mean, if you read through the letters uh, of, of Paul, especially, uh, but also of Peter and others, that you'll see that that's kind of, I mean, um, that's kind of the theme, like uh, always confronting something with the gospel and saying the gospel is better than whatever this other thing is. Um, but that, that, those are the two things I want you to see here, like everything he's doing is hitting scripture like they're like it's <laughs> if you had notes your your paper would be full of all of these references to go back and look through uh, about where you know apostasy was found in the church and how they dealt with it so this is great this is what we should be listening for right um i could care less about some tweetable moment about some rememberable phrase like what i want to know is um is the scripture being handled rightly um, and right now it, I mean, a hundred percent, um, we've still got a good portion of this sermon left. I'm assuming, I don't know if this, the rest of this video is the sermon, but, um, if this is any indication of what we're looking at, this is great. Um, because that all he's done so far is state his main point from the main scripture, which is first Timothy, um, pointed out now throughout other places in scripture about, Hey, this isn't just happening uh, you know, this isn't just a Timothy issue that Timothy's dealing with. This is an all over thing. Um, and this is kind of the, the, the state that the early church was in. They were, they were battling it from inward and outward. Um, so we're really setting the stage here for, uh, some context so that we understand. And I'm assuming he's probably going to move into uh, how they battled it and then what we should do to battle it. That would be my guess if I had to kind of um, put a guess out there of how he's going to structure this sermon. But right now he's laying a very firm foundation of context and culture um, for, to build upon. So let's see, let's see where he goes. So what's the takeaway for us here? As Paul said, be alert. Be alert. Stand on your toes. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, if you turn back to 1 Timothy 4, the Holy Spirit expressly says this will happen in the latter times. This will happen. It's not an if, it's a when. So we must be alert. Next he says, and I want you to write this in the, in the margin at the last part of verse one and in verse two, he says that we are to identify false teachers. So we are to expect apostasy and then we're to identify the false teachers. And what he outlines is essentially three markers of a false teacher, okay? The first one is this, and you see this in verse one, he says they apostatize. He says some will depart from the faith. Um, that phrase, some will depart from the faith, is a translation of one Greek word, apostasantai. It's literally transli transliterated into English, apostatize. It means that they withdraw from the faith. Uh, so here's the important thing to note. These people claim to be Christians. They claim to at one point hold the faith. Th these are people who are visible church members of the gathered church or teachers of the gathered church. But then they begin to withdraw. They begin to lose their hold of the faith, like a rock climber who falls off the face of the cliff they lose their grip on the doctrines that they once held dear. That word faith is being used objectively here to refer to the truths of Christianity. It's the doctrines that have been delivered. As Jude says, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's the, it's the doctrines that have been passed down by Christ and the apostles. That's an awesome point here. And this is, again, why understanding word usage and how it's used is important because 
Um, what he just pointed out, in case you didn't catch it, was that when he when uh, Paul is telling Timothy about their apostate from the faith, their faith, it's not that they actually have this faith. It's that this is what the faith is that they're apostate from, if that makes sense, right? Hopefully I'm saying it clear enough. I mean, I know he said it super clear, but the idea here is that those that are apostate from the gospel, from the, the truth of Christianity, um, when he uses the word faith here, it's not that it's the faith. It's not the faith that they possess. Rather, it is the faith of Christianity and what people believe in. So that's that's a really good distinction there because uh, that's making it clear that it's not that they even have faith. It's the appearance of this faith, um, which which again. When I was talking about translations and getting the sense of what's being said there, that's an important distinction. Like that's an incredibly important distinction. If you, um, if you don't pull that out or understand that, it, it would appear. It, I mean, it could appear as if he's saying that they have this faith. Um, that's a really good point. And that's again why good, um, good Bible teachers or preachers or teachers is because they draw this out, right? So you can explain every Greek word you want, but if you can't explain within the text here about how these words fit together and why they're said in a certain way, um, it's problematic. I, I've seen, and I think we've actually done a couple sermon reviews where um, a pastor has taken a certain translation of a verse that's like really more of a paraphrase and ran with that paraphrased version, which is not what the actual translation says and built a whole sermon on that trans that, that paraphrase verse, um, which you can obviously hopefully see why that's problematic because it's not even what the verse said. And now they're building a whole sermon off of it. So um, what Grant just did here was great. I want to give him a high five through the screen. Grant, I don't know if you'll ever see this, but right now, buddy, you're killing it. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I, I mean, there you go. There's my cards on the table. I don't see how this could go bad. In fact, I think you should just, just, just watch the sermon in the the link in the description. I don't know how much <laughs> how much help I'm going to be for the rest of it. This is just really good. Um, so let's keep going and see what happens. So, how this happens is one of two ways. Okay, one, it can happen through what's called a deconstruction. Maybe you've heard that word, but it, it happens when somebody starts questioning the doctrines. Do, do we really need a virgin conception? Do we really need a doctrine of hell? Do we really need one way? Aren't there many roads to God and Jesus is just the best road? People start questioning the doctrines of Christianity and then their faith begins to be dis deconstructed. And, and you can watch that in real time. And I'm sure many of you have had friends and family members walk down that road. But here's the other way it can happen. The other way it happens. Is okay, so here, just one thing here that I will interject that I think that's important. And I, I actually have to forcefully force myself to be conscious of this whenever I'm preaching. But uh, I think one of the things that would have been nice to add there, and again, this is just me talking to Grant. I'm not telling him how to run his church. I'm just saying that, like, I think verbally as pastors, we need to recognize that oftentimes we assume the people we're talking to are on the same page as us. Um, and sometimes they're not. Uh, there's uh, what, God has been very gracious in people coming up to me sometimes after sermons and kind of pushing back a bit on what I said, which is great because that means they were listening. Uh, it also means they didn't agree. So now we get to have a conversation about it. So Grant's wording here was, you know, you have friends, you have family, you've seen go through this, a nice addition. And he may add this. I don't know. Again, I just stopped it. So maybe he adds it here in a minute, but um, a nice addition would have been, and maybe you're going through this right now. So hopefully this sermon helps you in a way um, to, to firm up those foundations or to press into that a little bit harder, right? It just, just acknowledge the fact that there could be people in that congregation that are dealing with that and um, to, to help them understand that, look, I, I get it. You might be going through that. Um, so th now, again, something we don't know about this church. I don't know how the culture of the church is. The culture of the church may be very, like, family-oriented in the sense that it, like, like, like you don't have to agree with us. You're, we're still going to walk aside you and love you and answer your questions and be there for you. Um, that's very important to have in your church as a culture as well, because that, that helps the idea of saying just because you're questioning it doesn't mean like we're kicking you out. It just means that you need to understand what we believe here and that that's not going to change. Um, so anyway, that's just a little thing um, that kind of perked my ears there. I think sometimes it's, it's helpful to acknowledge that the people we're preaching to as pastors um, 
may not agree with us and welcome them into the the whole idea that look i i get it that you don't agree i'd love to have that conversation with you but just so you know this is where we stand on it um and just kind of say you know just make that known so anyway keep going is by beginning to add things onto christianity where it's jesus plus something it's jesus plus asceticism it's Jesus plus works. And remember what Paul said to the Galatians? He said, that, my friends, is a different gospel. It's a different Christianity. So if you, if you add on to it as well, you're just as much letting go. You think, oh, well, I've got my Christianity. I'm adding stuff onto it to make it better. But when you add stuff on to make it better, what you're actually doing is letting go of Christianity. Christianity is Jesus plus nothing. Grace plus nothing. You add one work, and it's a different religion. That's how it happens. Does this mean that these people have lost their salvation? On the contrary, it means that they never actually possessed it. They were never actually true, born-again believers. The Apostle John puts it like this in 1 John 2.19. He says, they went out from us. He's talking about people that apostatized, left the church. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, if they had been true believers, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. So when they left, that was the marker. It was clear. The pastor of the church I went to my freshman year in college, he basically taught a doctrine that said this. He said, as long as you pray a prayer at some point and that you're essentially genuine in your prayer of salvation, then you're saved. In other words, he really didn't require true repentance and faith in order to give assurance to somebody. And then he said, on the other side of salvation, you can really live however you want. You don't have to obey Christ's laws to be a Christian. He said, you should. You should obey Christ's laws, but you don't have to obey Christ's laws. I thought Jesus was Lord. I was troubled by that my freshman year, and I went home for the summer, and then I found out that that man had a mistress up in Colorado. And he was confronted by the elders of that church and he refused to repent. And he left. He left his family, he left four kids, and he left the church, and he left his Christian community. False teachers are the classic case of the Hebrews 6 person, right? Their minds have been enlightened by the things of God, they've tasted of the word of God, they know Christianity inside and out. They've been around the Holy Spirit. They've seen the Holy Spirit work. Maybe the Holy Spirit has even used them. You don't have to be a Christian. If, if the Holy Spirit can speak from Balaam's donkey, he can speak from anyone. And they deceived themselves, and eventually they fall away. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I kept wanting to stop that, but I want, it just kept getting better. So here is something that uh, a point that some of you may have cringed at was uh, they were never from us. So essentially he's saying that if, if this happens and somebody goes apostate, they were never really saved in the first place. If that, I know that there are people that were like, ah, how do you know? Because the people that we talk to that deconstruct often will say, um, no, no, I really believed it. I was really in it. Um, and I appreciate the fact that Grant went on to to not only give us a um, a very short, brief, but hard hitting kind of story, personal story there. But he also uh, talked about uh, a few other verses that point that out, the Hebrews verse uh, especially, and, and showing that. Um, I think Balaam's donkey was a good example, but also just showing that like you can know the Bible, you can be around the church, you can see the Holy Spirit working, you, the Holy Spirit may even use you to work, but that doesn't mean that you are um that you were ever part of the family of god which here's the thing that is that is that is two things that is both amazing and also like incredibly troubling right i mean that should be that should be incredibly troubling because there are people that have been in church their whole lives like um uh, just my story like i grew up in church my whole life thinking i was saved and it wasn't until freshman year of college that god got a hold of me and shook me and i understood who he was and uh, what i had done and the need of the cross and like so i grew up the entire time in church thinking i was seeing everybody um you know seeing prayers answered seeing miracles done believing that i was a christian because i said a prayer once like 
So I think his, exp his expounding on this point is helpful because oftentimes whenever um, someone adds to the gospel or deconstructs from Christianity, um, there's this idea of, well, maybe they were saved and they just kind of, you know, or, you know, what he said is, you know, um, how did he word it? I'm not sure. But the, the idea is that, you know, maybe they were saved and then they just, you know, they, they left it. But his point is that, like, the Bible is clear that they weren't ever saved. And just because they uh, God, you know, may have used them to do something or maybe they were around it and saw it and participated in it. Um, this is probably honestly, this is probably the clearest example I've ever heard of somebody that went apostate that was in it and looked like they were, but weren't actually like, I think that was a very good explanation, very short explanation, um, explaining how somebody could be in it forever, look like they're a believer, but then leave later. Um, I've said it before, like there, there, there was, there are people that I know that you can tell God just flipped a switch in right night and day different. Um, that now they're not perfect. God's still working on it, but there's this belief system in them that like, you're not going to, there is nothing that's going to, that's going to talk them out of it, take them away from it. Like they're all in. Um, and I think this is a distinction he's, he's pointing out and pulling out here. And this is really, really good. This is, um, that was good. I didn't know when to stop it, but that's why, um, I'd go back and listen to some of that <clears throat> because that was, that was solid. And the second marker, Paul says, is that they devote themselves to the teaching of demons. Um, that's also there at the end of verse one. It, I mean, this is, this is so insightful, isn't it? This is remarkable what he says because Paul's giving us this diagnostic of what is happening in the life of a false teacher. He says they devote themselves to deceitful spirits. Um, what's he talking about there? He's talking about demonic warfare. He's talking about the, 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 the deceit of demons and the teaching of demons. You see this because they become obsessed with a new teaching a new idea, a new ideology. And Paul says that they devote themselves to it. Isn't that an interesting verb? They devote themselves to it. It consumes them. They become all about this new teaching that has captivated them. It becomes all they talk about, all they post about on social media, what they want to bring up with friends and family. It begins to control them. What has happened? Well, Paul tells us, Evil spirits have staged a great deception in the heart. That's what they do, and that's why Paul calls them deceiving spirits. This is Satan's game. Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and this is, this is classic warfare, right? This is, uh, how did the Greeks defeat the Trojans? They tried to defeat them in battle. They said, this isn't working. And they built a big wooden horse. They said, we'll pretend to give a gift to their gods. And they got in their ships, and they went around the peninsula, and they waited. Oh, and they put some Greeks inside the horse. Don't forget that part. And they brought the horse in. They came out at night, opened the gate. Ships came back. Greeks came in. They deceived them. Satan is an angel of light. That's his game. He deceives. He lures. He deceived Eve in the garden by telling her the fruit would open her eyes. They practice deception. And they bring a new teaching to the apostatizer. Third, this is what happens. This is in verse 2. Paul says that their souls become cauterized. In verse 2, he says, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. That word for insincerity is hypocrisis. It's where we get our word hypocrisy. They all okay, I know I've stopped this a few times to talk about specifically him using words, but that this is something that is important in the sense that you need to know what words mean. So I think oftentimes we, we assume we know what the words mean, um, but it is very helpful to see, um, and there's tools, there's free tools online that you can use. I'll put a couple in the description to go through and just look yourself. Now, again, uh, are there, is there like, are these full fledged, amazing tools you can use all the time? Um, no, but they're very helpful in Bible study and things like that. Uh, they will get you, they'll scratch the surface, kind of like what he's doing here with these words to help you understand them better. But this is important to do. Because we have assumptions about certain words we read, and if we're not clear about what they mean, um, we again, I mean, it'll lead to assumptions that are wrong. So this is something you want to listen for, not only the word usage, but let me step back and say one more thing about how he kind of unpacked that statement before as far as uh, those that left from us were not among us. Oftentimes, pastors... Um, so 
pastors, let me speak to you real quick. Oftentimes we, um, we know what we mean when we say something. So we'll make a blanket statement. Uh, and then, um, because we know what we mean, because we've studied it all week and we've prayed over it all week. And, um, we've prepared the sermon. Like we, we are already connecting those dots. And so we assume those out in the congregation are connecting the same dots. Why I think it's helpful what he did before, as far as unpacking everything is helpful because he's walking people through his thought process through scripture. So it's not left up to them to assume what he means by they were never really Christians in the first place, because that statement can be pretty ambiguous. You can read a little bit into it. Um, and it can be, it can be honestly a little bit, um, hurtful, I suppose, if you have a friend or family member that's went through it and you walked alongside them the whole time and you were like, no, I really thought they were Christian. The idea here is when he unpacks it and he points to scripture and gives examples for that, um, it helps, a, it humanizes the experience a bit. So now we go, okay, well, we did see this, that, you know, they understood it, God used them and they still want to apostate. So with him explaining that it's, it, it, it's walking the congregation through what he's already thought through. So if that makes sense, I, I wanted to make sure I said that as well, along with the whole making sure we look at the word usage. But it's important that we do that and not just assume that the congregation is hearing what we're hearing. And if, if you're a congregant listening to a pastor and you hear a pastor make a blanket statement and not kind of explain it, um, obviously this is going to depend on your personality. But I would I would ask him what he meant by that a little later. Send him a very, you know, a kind email not a, uh, or, or meet him after the service maybe and just kind of dig in a little bit. Because oftentimes pastors, like he, he'll, be, he'll be able to explain what he meant by that because he's already thought through it. He just didn't walk everyone else through it. So what we see here Grant doing, walking through that with everybody was, was very helpful. So let's keep going. They are hypocrites because they still want to be called Christians. They still want to wear the Christian jersey, but they no longer hold to the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. They're actually not Christians at all. Paul says, rather, they have become liars. Pseudo logoi, pseudo false logos word. They advance a false word, not just a lie, but an. I can't say this enough, but just just pay attention to what he's doing here. If he if he does this again, I will not break in and interrupt because I want you to see it happen in real time. But he's breaking down these words for us in such a way that we then understand the sense of how they're being said in the text that we might otherwise miss. Maybe we won't. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll get the idea here. But th he's doing so just in case you're not fully understanding what Paul is telling Timothy within the culture and the context and what's going on. He's breaking these Greek words down and showing us how they connect and actually how they have quite a one-two punch to them. Um, that Paul's saying something quite forceful here that we may miss because we don't fully understand um, the, the wording that he's using. An entire worldview, an entire teaching, an entire ideology, a controlling doctrine being advanced. And what's fascinating here is Paul says that their very consciences, their very hearts have been seared in the process. Their conscience has been cauterized so that it no longer is able to tell them what is right and what is wrong. Now, here's the important implication of this. It means that the false teaching that they are advancing becomes a part of who they are. It becomes a part of who they are. That's good. A false teacher isn't going to necessarily realize that they're a false teacher. That's how deceived they are. Uh, Paul puts it like this in 2 Timothy 3.12. He says, imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So they're deceiving others, but they're also being deceived themselves because their conscience, what, what convicts them regarding the truth, regarding true virtue, has been seared. And that's why when you question the false teaching that they're advancing, the ideology that they're advancing, it's so personal. The lie has become part of them. And so to question the lie is to question them. Next to verse three, I want you to write, diagnose the false teaching. So expect apostasy, identify false teachers, then diagnose the false teaching. Okay, and what I want you to see here real quick is that he's working through points, right? So he's, th these are the three points he's working through, but he's working through them not as points that he's developed, but he's walking his congregation through the scripture, showing how Paul is outlining this for Timothy in order to do the exact things that he's saying, right? So 
oftentimes, I don't know what kind of church you grew up in, but the churches I grew up in were like three, four, five point sermons, right? Where it's point one, point two, point three, point four. But often those points were points that were derived from the pastor's overall outline. So if it was topical, it'd be five, um, be five points on whatever that topic was. Or if he was working through a text, sometimes it would be the five points that uh, he, he was specifically drawing out of the text. But what Grant's doing here that I incredibly appreciate, and I think this is great preaching, is that he's walking them through the points that Paul specifically is making to Timothy. Now, you're not going to be able to do this with every text. In fact, the only reason you're able to do it here with the text in Timothy is because this is how Paul is writing the letter, so it's easier to do. Um, so don't force it onto a text. But when the text presents it in this way, it's incredibly helpful to do this because now not only not only is the congregation seeing the the flow of thought within the text, you're already doing that, but alongside of that, now you're bringing life application into the text and doing some at the same time, right? Oftentimes when we preach through a text, we have to go and say, well, this is the culture, the context, what was being said then, and then go, and this is how it applies to us. But Grant is doing this really cool thing where he's doing both at the same time intentionally. Um, and I, this is helpful um, because it's in, it's, it's walking the congregation through what we should do right alongside how Paul is walking Timothy through it. Notice how Paul easily and succinctly states the false teaching um, in verse 3. He says, this is what they teach. They forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I love how succinct he is. Obviously, uh, there were layers and layers and layers to this false teaching. Uh, there were benefits that they said that you could receive uh, from this false teaching. There were uh, numerous things that were added on, but Paul reduces it here to simply a sentence. And in a nutshell, this is what they were teaching. He says they forbid marriage and they require abstinence from foods. Now, what's interesting about this is these false teachers had essentially taken a half-truth and distorted it. Does Jesus recommend fasting in the Sermon on the Mount? He does. He does. Does Paul say that singleness is good in 1 Corinthians 7? He does, but he also says that it's not a sin to get married. Are we supposed to fast indefinitely from all sorts of meats? No, we're not. So what these false teachers had done is they'd taken a, a grain of truth and distorted it and built a different Christianity on top of it. They had advanced a new sanctification by asceticism. He said, don't get married and don't eat certain type of foods. And if you do this, you will be a really holy person. You'll be a really sanctified person if you do these things. Here's the problem with that. The Bible says, be in the world, but not of the world. Not to withdraw completely from the things of the world. We're not ascetics. We're not meant to withdraw to receive a certain type of holiness. I remember visiting uh, this place in Greece called Metoria. Has anybody ever been to Metoria? They filmed a James Bond film there early on, but it's basically these rock formations that are like 200, 300 feet high. And what these priests did in the 11th century is they built monasteries on top of these huge pillars. And the only way to get up there, I mean, you can't walk up these rocks. They, they, would, uh, they built ladders, rope ladders, or they had a pulley, little pulley elevators, and that was the only way to get up there. And these priests would live in caves up on, up on the rocks and essentially all day pray, fast, and uh, copy uh, scripture. And you, you go up there, and when I was touring it, I went around one corner, and there was a room just filled with skulls, hundreds of skulls. And the tour guide said, those are the priests that lived here. They kept their skull here as a marker that they endured this. Hundreds of skulls, all deceived into this false sanctification that if they somehow could just get away from the world, they would be more holy. There's always been some type of tendency towards this that Satan is advancing in the church. In the third century, there was a group called the Desert Fathers who did the same thing. They went out to the deserts in Egypt and they went and lived in caves. They said, we're gonna get out of the world. But what they found is, is that they could leave the world, but that they took their own sinful natures with them. Some of them, this is, this is fascinating, even lived on pillars, like a little pillar. They called them style lights, 30, 40 feet up, and they would just sit up on a pillar their entire life. People would bring food and... and, and raise it up to him as a, as a new form of sanctification. What Paul is doing here is he is diagnosing the false teaching. And as he's diagnosing it, he's very perceptive. 
And he's saying, if you notice at the end of that statement in verse three, he says, God created th- th- these things to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Uh, what Paul is saying there is that this does nothing for your sanctification. You think that you're getting ahead? You think that you're getting more holy? This does nothing for your sanctification. God created these things. He created food. He created it to be received with thanksgiving who believe and know the truth. And and real quickly here, what what you need to know about false teachers is they're almost always going to attack three doctrines, one of the three. The first is justification, how you are made right before God. They are going to add something to how you are justified or they are going to take away something. Second, sanctification, that's this case. They're going to add something about how you can become more righteous before God. They add a new law, they add a type of stringent legalism, or they take laws away. They, said, they say you don't need to, uh, to follow Christ, you don't need to obey the lordship of Christ. They advance a no law Christianity. Or third, they attack the doctrine of glorification. And that's how and when justified Christians receive resurrected bodies and enter the eternal state. Uh, Almost all of your cults, your modern day cults, are that type of false teaching. So Jim Jones and David Koresh, all those people, what they did is they said, hey, we're gonna gonna get people together. The end of the world's coming. Jesus is coming back. They distort the true Christian doctrine of glorification. And by the way, this is what Paul was dealing with in Thessalonians, is that false teachers had gone into that church and said that you've missed the second coming. Christ has already come back. So Paul had to correct that. So what are we to do? Next to verse four, right? Attack with God's word. All right. So real quick, I think it's helpful often whenever we're making points to give <clears throat> some sort of um, example, right? So we can talk about um, the things that Paul, maybe Paul was facing the entire time that he was preaching, or if we're in another part of the scriptures, right? Something that Jesus was confronting or something James was confronting or something maybe in the old Testament that the prophets were confronting. So that's all very helpful, and it's very good to, to, to make those connections. But oftentimes, people don't have a one-to-one comparison. And there may not be always a one-to-one comparison, but what we see Grant do here was say, hey, these are the things that Paul is dealing with. This is sort of what you would see nowadays, right? So he specifically gives examples as far as David Koresh and John Jones, or the Jones. Um, but in the other examples, it's this idea of just saying, hey, look for somebody that's adding something to Jesus or taking something away from Jesus. Um, but the idea is that whenever we're listening, because oftentimes, look, here's the thing. I <laughs> Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you don't learn like me. I totally understand that, you know, lots of different person, personality types. But the idea here is that um, we... As pastors, we need to make sure that there are people that are in the congregation that are going to think differently than us as far as how they process information. And they may need examples to say, hey, these are, you know, this is the similar thing that we see here in scripture. So we just need to keep that in mind. I think Grant did a good job there. But the idea is to keep that in mind that sometimes, honestly, I think we, he could have used a few other examples to kind of give uh, other than just the last example. Uh, of the different cults there, but this example of, you know, maybe adding something to justification or taking something away or adding something to sanctification or taking something away, just to give a one-to-one comparison for people that um, may not fully understand what that looks like. Because oftentimes I found when I talk to people, maybe you're you're thinking in that nature, but uh, you are participating in that sort of type of thinking, but you are listening to people that maybe perpetuate that, but you don't know that because it's not been very clearly stated. It's just been alluded to. And then because it's just been alluded to, we're not making that, you know, we don't make those connections. What's helpful, um, and I think it's clearest seen when he named like David Kresh, for example, uh, is whenever we say, no, that's what that looks like. And we go, oh, okay. Thank you. Like that gives us a one-to-one comparison to say, you know, this is what they're talking about. This is sort of the modern day equivalent. And then now we can see that clearer. So just as pastors, we need to keep that in mind uh, as we're preaching to give really good, clear examples of if there is a doctrine that we're confronting that we, we say, so today, now and today, this is sort of what it would look like comparatively to this sort of ministry or this sort of teacher. Um, just to give a clear example of that. Not that he did a bad job of it. I just think that um, that is really helpful for congregations um, because sometimes the vagueness makes it kind of confusing for us to make, you know, for people in the pews to make that connection. So let's keep going. How do you then respond? You attack with God's word. I want you to notice here what Paul is doing, not just what he's saying. The only offensive weapon that the believer is given is the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. Notice how Paul responds. He says, look, for everything created by God is good. What's that a reference to? 
Genesis chapter 1. Remember, after every day of creation, God says, this is good. He's paraphrasing Genesis 1. He says, for everything God created is good. It's all good. And then he says, nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. That's Acts chapter 10. Remember, the Lord came to Peter in a vision, and he says, look, Peter, take and eat. You can eat these things. You just need to receive it with thanksgiving as coming from the Lord. And Paul taught this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. In other words, give thanks to God for what he has given. So the principle that Paul's laying out is to use God's word and the principles that are taught in God's word to confront the claims of false teachers. And actually, that's exactly what he says in verse five explicitly. Look at verse five. He says, the food is made holy by the word of God. In other words, God said you can eat it. So you can eat it. It's in God's word, so you can eat it and by prayer. What does he mean by that? He's talking about prayer of thanksgiving. That's why we say a blessing for our meals, that you thank God that he has given you that food that he has provided for you, and Paul says that it's sanctified, that it's made holy. We can eat anything. We aren't under dietary laws, but we must eat it and receive it by prayer of thanksgiving. So to review, we expect apostasy, we identify the false teachers, we diagnose the false teaching, and we attack with the word of God. Now, I realize that the issue that we are facing in the church today is not an abstinence from marriage or food. Is anybody espousing that? Um, So what I'd like to do is I'd like to, just with the few minutes that we have left, is apply these principles that Paul just taught us to a contemporary issue. Okay, so here, he is going to do exactly what we just talked about. So this is the... (laughs) This is the downside of not watching these sermons beforehand because I didn't know he was going to do this. So what's helpful here is that he is going to show us, and I, I'm kind of very interested about what he's using modern day of equivalency for here, but he's going to show us that, hey, this is what Paul said. This is the thing we're dealing with. So we deal with this thing with the principles that he just laid out um, in, in scripture that he just went over. So let's see what he points out and then, uh, probably how he then applies those principles to the things that we're not dealing with now as the modern church. I'm very interested in what he's going to say. Let's keep going. An issue I want to apply it to is the whole notion of critical theory and the new definition of social justice that is being applied now in the church. Is that contemporary? Yes, it is. So let's, let's use the rubric that Paul lays out for us. Expect apostasy. Should we, should we be surprised that there is false teaching in the modern conservative evangelical church? No. Paul said it would happen. He said expect it. This will happen in the latter times. I think it is surprising. I was talking to a friend recently. It is surprising because I really didn't know about this teaching. 2017, 2018, I started to hear about it, and then it just caught fire. And then it seemed to be everywhere. It's on the outside, We're seeing it all over the culture, but we're also seeing it on the inside. And again, as Paul said, we shouldn't be surprised. We should expect apostasy, so it should not surprise us. Second, we need to identify false teachers. We need to identify false teachers. Now, I want to clarify here that there is a spectrum. Not everyone who has embraced parts of critical theory and its definition of social justice is a false teacher though I think many will reveal themselves to be false teachers, and many have showed themselves to already be false teachers. Uh, Some believers are confused. Some born-again believers are confused, and they've been deceived. Uh, In Pilgrim's Progress, right at the end, Christian was deceived. He was led off the path, and he was led into a web, and God had to come and rescue him out of that. Some Christians are there right now. So I think what he's doing here is very helpful. Oftentimes, like... Whenever we see something wrong, we'll go in full bore. So if we see a, you know, a false doctrine being espoused or some incorrect teaching being espoused, we'll go in like with guns blazing, uh, just modocking everybody down that even said anything about it. What he's doing here is very helpful. And he's, he's being gracious, but I, if, I, if I'm guessing correctly, he's being gracious because he's about to go in a little, press a little harder. But he wants to preface that with, this understanding that not everybody that's doing this is necessarily a false teacher. Rather, they're just deceived and they're buying into something because, as he said before earlier in the sermon, there's a grain of truth to it. And then they're building a whole doctrine on the grain of truth, which I don't know if he'll address again or not, but I think it would be helpful. But um, I think this is where this thought process is coming from. There are people that are espousing uh, critical race theory um, as the new doctrine and, 
and he's saying that they're not necessarily false teachers, but they just might be deceived by. So he's being incredibly gracious here, which I think is helpful. I think this is needed whenever we talk about uh, any issue we see within the church is that we approach it graciously, but then we press hard on those that um, clearly aren't deceived and clearly are teaching a false doctrine. Um, let's see where this goes because, um, yeah, let's just see where this goes. They have been deceived. And it's going to take Christians speaking the truth in love and God and the power of the Holy Spirit, snatching them out of that deception. But other people, they're going out from us because they were not with us. They're peddling this ideology and they are completely giving themselves over to it. What's fascinating what Paul says is he says they become devoted to the doctrine of demons. Devoted to the doctrine of demons. What is the source of critical theory? Let me read you a quote. This is, this is a quote um, from a guy named Todd Pruitt. He says, if you care to read the architects of critical theory, Horkheimer, Fromm, Adorno, Marcuse, you will find that their project was animated in large part by a desire to undermine Christianity and its moral and philosophical norms. They believe these norms inhibited the sexual and intellectual evolution of mankind. You will also find that many of these scholars coming out of the 1930s Frankfurt School, listen, considered Satan an important symbol of mankind's empowerment and independence. So make no mistake, this doctrine is the doctrine of demons. I want to read you a quote from a sermon from a man that has had a massive and formidable influence in my life. Okay, so two things real quick. One, we've talked about quotes when we were talking about when we did the Owen Strand sermon. Um, when people quote people or reference people um, in positive lights, which he's apparently about to do with somebody that I'm not sure of yet, but the, it just shows the kind of, okay, these are the lenses these people are viewing things from, which is helpful. But two, I do want to touch on the fact that I don't know if you're familiar with uh, critical race theory, anything like that, but if you're not, what he's doing here is... Um, is putting himself out on a limb a bit. This is definitely, a, there, there are probably a handful of divisive issues right now in the church. Um, this is one of them. So the fact that he's, he's making this statement, um, he, he's clearly putting himself on, 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 a, on a side of a line um, and saying, this is where I stand on this. And this is why I stand here scripturally. Um, that being said, I think he's doing a great job at it. Uh, I, I just want to be clear. Like, I don't know where this sermon is going, but it's been solid so far. I do not see it going off path. Um, but I just want you to hear that. Like, it's, there's people that try to be like, oh, no, I'm not going to take sides. You know, Jesus is my only theology. Well, there's a point where scripture actually forces you to take a side. Okay. I mean, it, it comes to a point where you, you have to say, I'm compelled by scripture to stand here. Um, which is what I believe Grant's doing. He's just simply saying, here's a doctrine I see that is incorrect, that is being preached in the church, and this is why I am going to apply what Paul told Timothy to apply to certain false doctrines. I am now going to take that and apply it to this false doctrine. Um, and he's working through that right now. So let's keep going, see who he quotes, who had a massive influence on his life. Let's see. Has deeply impacted me. He said this in a sermon. This is just three weeks ago, four weeks ago. He says, I believe there are pieces of critical race theory that are helpful for us understanding this moment. The ideology as a whole is a terrible God and demonic in origin. So why use it? If it's demonic in origin, if, if it's from Satan, then why call it helpful? Why point Christians to it? I say all that so that you can know and make no mistake that this is a doctrine of demons. Okay, time out. So that's very interesting. So I don't know if I'm totally correct, but I'm almost positive that is a quote from Matt Chandler. Which, if, if I'm right in that, um, what that means is that Chandler has had a great impact on Grant, um, but he's pulling that quote out and saying, but not naming him, but saying that, that this, isn't, this isn't helpful. Like if, He's basically saying, if you think it's helpful, but it's not a good gospel, why are you you know, saying that it is. So I think this is, a, this, that's very interesting that he's not telling us that it was Chandler that said that, which again, I could be wrong, but I believe that's, I, I watched that sermon and I'm almost positive that's, that's a Matt Chandler quote. So 
it's interesting here that he pulls that out and says, this person's had a great influence on me. This is what he said. I don't agree with it. And then doesn't name him, which there, there can be positives and negatives to naming and calling somebody out in a sermon, right? Um, you want to be careful how you do that. Um, you want to be um, gracious when you do that. Um, but that's interesting that he doesn't name him. Let's keep going. So how do we diagnose the false teaching? What is it actually teaching? Paul does this succinctly. Let me try to succinctly sum it up for you. This is my definition. Critical theory is a school of thought which places everyone in social categories, essentially of either victim or oppressor, based on the cultural, historical, and sociological factors regarding things like their gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. It then seeks to eliminate oppression in society by dismantling systems and structures that are perceived to continue oppression. And oppression, and this is so important, is redefined not as equality, but equity. Not as equal opportunity, but equal outcome. In other words, it's a Marxist ideology redone. It's equal outcome. In other words, if you don't have the same stuff, the same opportunities as somebody else, you're a victim and somebody's oppressed you. That's what it's saying. Um, how do you recognize it? Here's how you recognize it. If someone says to you that you need to repent of something that you didn't do, if somebody says to you that you owe something because of something that you personally didn't take, but you owe it because you are a certain gender, certain sexuality, certain ethnicity, so on and so forth. Let me give you a quote from Carl Truman. He says this, critical theory rests on simple therapeutic premises. It leaves no room for argument or doubt. For all its sophisticated language, critical theory portrays life as a zero-sum game. Some people do not have power. They struggle and do not flourish. This happens because somebody else has seized power from them and oppresses them in an ongoing and unrelenting way. The oppression has solidified into a self-justifying system. There's a comprehensive explanation for all the evils we suffer. So that's critical theory. That's diagnosing the false teaching. Now, let me just, with the time that we have, give you several principles by which you can combat it with God's word. Right? This is the last. So this is important, right? So oftentimes, not only what he's going to say here, but oftentimes uh, what will happen is that pastors will get up and condemn something but not give any actionable steps from the gospel on how to address it and... Um, you know, combat it. Like it'll be this and that and this and the other are really, really bad things. Stay away from them. But they won't give any uh, actionable steps to say, this is how we do this biblically. So what I think is important here, running off of what he's running off of, First Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5, and the principle he's laid out here in those verses, and then now he's applying that to this critical race theory. First of all, let me just say that this sermon uh, structure is really, really good in the sense that he, he took the scripture, worked through it, showed what Paul was talking to Timothy about, how to address it, how to recognize it, and then brings up a, a process and a doctrine that is being espoused now that's false and says, okay, let's take that same rubric and we're going to apply it to this false doctrine and shows how um, that the, the, the application doesn't change. Just the false teachings do. So let's see what he says as far as how to preach the gospel and address false doctrine now using the same things that Paul told Timothy to use when he was addressing the false doctrine of his day. Uh, and that looks like this. That'll probably pretty much sum that up when we get through this. The last point that Paul does, you attack with God's word. Uh, you, you, you speak it in love. We do this because we love the people that, that we are confronting, but at the same time, we must attack with God's word. Let me give you just, some, just a few principles from Scripture. First, critical theory places unmerited guilt and condemnation on people. It says that you're guilty of something that you personally didn't do. Ezekiel says this in Ezekiel 18, 19. Write this down, this reference. Ezekiel says, Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? Why shouldn't you be held accountable for the sins of your father or your forefathers or the fathers after them? And he says this, when the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. It's the soul who sins that shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. That word righteousness, you could translate it justice. The justice of the justice will be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So the principle is this, is that when you stand before God, God treats you as an individual. You don't have to repent of a sin of someone who looks like you. 
or, ser or shares your skin color or your socioeconomic class. You will stand before God, not based on the fact that you are an American or anything else. You will stand before God based on the fact that you're either a sinner or you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, period. People ask, well, doesn't Daniel confess the sins of the nation? Doesn't he confess when he's in Babylon the sins of the people? He does, but Daniel was in a covenant with those people. Daniel was under the Mosaic covenant. He was bound in that covenant with those people, and that's why they're in Babylon. That's why he's confessing the sins of the people. What covenant are you in? The new covenant. What does the new covenant say? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Don't let anybody put condemnation on your head that Christ has told you not to carry. You're in a new covenant by his blood. Second, this, this is so serious. It violates the principle of partiality. Uh, James says this, you should study James chapter two, you should mark it up because this is the key to reconciliation in the church. It's no partiality. James says this, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The moment that you start making a, a distinction, you are exercising partiality. And this church, by God's grace, I don't know a racist person in this church, and we will not tolerate racism. We will not tolerate partiality towards somebody's skin or somebody's socioeconomic class or somebody's gender or any of these things. We, by God's grace, will be a church that treats everyone as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We are united by the great things of God. And I, and I pray that this church has all sorts of people, that it's representing uh, the community here and, and poor people and rich people. But we are going to come together and by the power of the Holy Spirit, treat people with equity and fairness and no partiality. The moment that you start exercising partiality, man, it is a cancer in the church. That's what James says. So I could have stopped it between anything there, but hopefully... Again, I don't know. What he's stating here is a pretty big statement, right? That can only be lived out through if you attend this church, if you're part of this biblical community. But it's not, uh, I, th I think we can uh, make this roundabout statement for any church. So if you're a pastor and you get up and you make this statement that he just made, you are now, um, you, you're going to have to hold that up, right? So what he said was, we are a church that has no partiality. Uh, to people, uh, depending on their socioeconomics, their skin tone, uh, their their sex or their gender, right? Which means that um, within that within that framework, the idea is that anybody can come, anybody can um, uh, worship, anybody can be, um, uh, you know, with that community. Uh, now, obviously, there are there are going to be biblical distinctions there. Um, as far as sexuality goes, I mean, there's clear uh, scripture for that that we can go into in a different video. Uh, I did cover uh, not too long ago where the Southern Baptist Convention defellowshipped some churches because of uh, who they were uh, allowing to be members and leaders. Uh, and that's, that's a much deeper discussion. But the idea here, is, and that's why this, I tie this into this, is that if you're going to make that statement as a pastor, um, you're going to have to be very clear about what that means, <laughs> okay? Because some, depending on which direction uh, somebody is approaching that statement at, that could mean different things. And this is where, and he might clarify, I don't think he's really got time to truly clarify that. Um, I think that would be something that, unfortunately, because of the time restraints he's put on this sermon and because of how much is here, he's not going to be able to unpack that. But... Um, there's a lot there specifically, and if we're just going to be honest, specifically within the, uh, the gender and sexuality category that he's talking about, um, there, there's a lot there that needs to be unpacked that he's, I don't, he's not going to have time to do that in this sermon. Um, but when you make that statement, I think it's just important as a pastor to understand how the congregation's hearing that, because there's a bunch of people, um, <laughs> that I follow because <clears throat> I'm just interested in how they process the world. But um, that'll say that, you know, it's kind of a joke now within that, that this community that I follow that, you know, the everybody's welcome, everybody's family, everybody's loved. Like they make fun of that phrase because when you go to a church, 
then that's shown to be what they would consider untrue because of who's allowed to be members and who's about to be leaders. So I think as a church, when we make this statement, which I think is a good biblical statement, we just need to be clear about what we mean by that, though, because it's it's obvious that it's confusing to some people. Um, and there's a lot to work out there. I don't have time to do it in this video either because this is already an hour and 25 minutes long uh, or right close to it. Um, so let's finish up this sermon, give closing thoughts and wrap it up. I'm in a hurry here. We got to we got to be moving. I'm just going to give you these last few very briefly. Third, it hardens people to the gospel by making false victims. Um, what's happening right now is everybody's claiming a victim status. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Latino female or, or whatever. I, I therefore am some type of victim. Look, we're all some type of victims at some point. Everybody has been some type of victim, but here's the problem with just trying to claim victim status everywhere you look. There's several problems with it, but here's one in light of the gospel. What the law of God says and what Paul lays out in Romans 1, 2, and 3 is that we are all actually offenders of the law, and we are all in need of the gospel. We are all unjust, where critical theory teaches people that it's, the issue is the oppressors that, that are oppressing us. The Bible says, no, the, the actual issue is the fact that you are a sinner before God, and you need to repent. You need to be reconciled with him. And just one more, let me give you one more, is because everyone is claiming some sort of victim status, it prevents us from seeing the real victims that are in this world. What happens with some, when somebody's a victim but it doesn't fall into the narrative that's out there? They get overlooked, they don't get the help that they need. It prevents us from seeing the real victims to show the love of Christ to them. Look, by God's grace, um, we're holding to the truth. The elders here are unified, we're towing the line. Um, this congregation is towing the line, but we need to keep being watchful. We need to be prepared. We need to expect apostasy. We need to identify the false teachers. We need to uh, diagnose the false teaching, and we need to confront the truth and confront it in love. Here's the good news, okay? Christ is building his church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Christ is building his church. This is a true church, born-again believers. We're gonna spur each other on in the blood and the righteousness of Christ, and Christ will continue to build his church. But let's follow this warning and stay vigilant. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for how clear your word is. We thank you, Lord, for this warning. And we thank you, Lord, for your truth, which guides us in this world. And it is hard to face friends and those that we've respected and loved and cherished who are going a different direction. And we pray, Lord, that they would not be apostates, but instead would be deceived. And we pray, Lord, that we would have the courage to speak the truth, to speak the truth in love, we thank you, Lord, for how clear your truth is and that the Holy Spirit is at work. And we thank you, Lord, for how you are building this church through the truth of the gospel in churches across this country by the truth of the gospel. Christ, build your church. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so he ends. Let me say the one thing that I think, I don't know if this was a problem, but I think, um, I think the end was rushed a bit. Um, so this isn't really much of a criticism of being like, oh, look, a red flag, as much as it is that as pastors, sometimes we need to be um, aware of the time constraints we have. I think the sermon was really, really good uh, leading up to, you know, walking through the text, showing what Paul was teaching Timothy, showing him how to address it. Honestly, and again, this isn't my church. This isn't obviously anything, but this would be as pastors, this would be a suggestion for us. I think the sermon would have been better if he would have uh, cut it at the end of the text and then said, hey, come back tonight where we're going to look at a couple of false doctrines and apply this truth to those doctrines. And then he would have given himself time to actually dive into uh, what those doctrines are, why they're false, and how to apply the gospel consistently to them. Because I feel like the end, the tell end here was kind of really, really rushed. It was like watching a really good show, like every episode gets better, and then you get to the season finale, and you're like, what was that? Like, that. that's what I felt. Like, I think, again, I think this is a really great sermon. I think there's a lot that we can learn from here um, in regards to what we should listen for. So looking at the words that we have within the text, uh, what's the sense of what's happening, right? What is the original meaning? Is it the meaning that we're thinking? If it is, great. How do we apply that? I think that he did a really good job of tying in examples um, that were incredibly helpful to how to use the scripture now and for us to kind of paint kind of word. He did that a couple times where he painted some word pictures so that we understand um, what we're reading. I think he did a really good job. 
of and something we should listen for in sermons as far as you know the sermon structure being built in such a way that it's very easy to follow um part of the reason it's easy to follow is because he's doing it expositionally so i think all of those things are really really great the one part that i think if i were to if i would have walked into this church on you know february 14th that morning and sat down the one thing that i would have been really not confused about but like i just felt like the end was really really rushed <laughs> like it was all of this great biblical information and then we tried to squish it into like five and ten minutes and it just wasn't it wasn't as breathed out and like worked out as it could have been so um that's the only criticism i have of the whole thing like and i think part of that as pastors we just need to look at ourselves and say hey how can we break this up in, in a in a way that's understandable because i think the first half was amazing like this the working through scripture looking at the words applying it helping us understand it was great and the last part was incredibly rushed so we just need to i think this last part is just for pastors if you're a pastor listening to this i think i myself need to be aware of this as well like we need to say what we need to say in a time frame that's respectable to the people that are there right or if you want to go two hours fine if you want to go three hours if your congregation is cool with that go for it but the point is allow yourself enough time to adequately unpack what you're saying so um, i would agree with grant i think that critical race theory there's a lot there that he could he could have pulled out to show the false doctrine of it how to approach the gospel with it um he just didn't we just didn't have enough time to do that in the time frame he gave himself so other than that, great sermon. Lots of good things we can listen for here. The one big thing that it's not really even a red flag as much as just a takeaway for pastors and congregations is that we need to allow ourselves uh, the proper amount of time to actually um, proper amount of time to actually show those things. So. With that being said, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for following. Thank you for subscribing. And thank you guys for sharing these. This is uh, some of the things, uh, messages I get from people uh, from where they're like, no joke, like never would have thought like they they watch them as a group and then talk about them <laughs> this is crazy strange to me so uh, if you found these helpful give this video a like share it it helps the algorithm because you know we all have to bow down to the uh, algorithm um, and if you want to support this channel i purposefully don't monetize these sermon review videos because i feel like that there's just an icky feeling <laughs> to think about monetizing a sermon review but if you want to support me you can go to uh the link in the description odgapparel.com is our uh our partners over there we have a lot of we have some merchandise such as this this uh this this shirt here sort of a childish shirt but you get the idea but you can go over there and check out all of that and support um what we do through um, our partners over at ODG Apparel. So guys, thank you once again for following, sharing, liking, all the cool things that you do. I'll talk to you later.